Hi. Um, I'm going to share with you, which I think is one of the most important experiments of the 21st century. It's an experiment how one country called Estonia is opening its digital borders to everybody so that everybody can become an e-Estonians. So, if you're e-Estonian and we may end up achieving eventually worldwide digital inclusion. So join me the, uh, the journey now. Uh, it all started in 2002. I can say that my name in Estonia is 387-1201-2796. And I'm very proud of that name. I think it's a beautiful name. My other name, Casper, opens me some doors in Estonia. I can buy liquor from shop. I can travel with that name. But my other name, the number, opens up a new set of doors. And I'll give you some brief overview of what doors they are. In the recent last two, two months, actually, I haven't been in Estonia at all. I'm traveling all around the world these days, and, but my work still carries on. For example, in last elections, in local elections in Estonia, I voted while I was in Tansk in Poland. Last three times I haven't been in Estonia in the elections. I can use that card to vote. Last time I declared taxes, it took me less than two minutes using that card. I digitally signed just today a new contract with my new employee while I was here in Paris. And because of spring, I have this allergy. So I called my doctor and I got e-prescription. And I went home and I managed to get the e-prescription using that card. So all the life is built on top of that card. And the special business. You can establish company using that card wherever you are within a few minutes. And this started in 2002. And we have had that society for over 15 years now. And what happened 18 months ago? that we open these doors for everybody, so that everybody can become e-Estonians. I started to run that program 18 months ago. And that point of time, I didn't have much understanding of why should we do it as a government? What's the benefits? What's the use cases? Why anyone would like to become an e-resident of Estonia? But I started this as a government startup. Uh, so I made launch page like startups do where we managed to subscribe yourself. Next day, next day when I woke up, there were over 4,000 people subscribed themselves, all wanted to become e-Estonians. There were from 120 different countries. At that point of time, like, I really like, stressed about that, what, what, what was happening about now. <laughs> because I thought I'd still go back to my work. It was just a scholarship program. But suddenly it started to grow and grow and the people internationally joining this community. So what is e-resident? Who is e-resident? E-resident is the same person who has this digital name given by government, government of Estonia. And using that name, you can authenticate yourself or digitally sign any documents. You have a private key on, on that card, and you can use that private key then. If you want to become e-resident, there is a website, eresident.gov.e. You pay 100 euros. You feel the data, Estonia is doing background check of you. If you're not criminal, you receive a letter that come and pick up the card. Then you have this one face-to-face -face meeting. You can choose out of 39 foreign embassies where you give your fingerprints, identify yourself with passport, and then you receive the card. And this is your digital name, which you can carry on with you. Since then, since the beginning, since the launch, which was one year ago, we have changed many, many laws in Estonia, and we have now full government support. I'm now running a team of seven members, uh, and uh, together with the government, we are taking it quite seriously now. And it has kind of grown out of our hands in that sense that that e-residents demand more services than we can offer. I'll give you one example or two examples who are the residents today and what they do. Uh, please meet Stanislav. Stanislav is from Ukraine, Stanislav Urin, and he's a painter. 
and uh, he loves to paint, but because of political situations, the internal market was, wasn't so good in Ukraine. And uh, he ma had to make a decision whether he quits painting or he find an and finds another job. Then he became e-resident, and using the e-residence card, he established this own company, bank account, got payment provider, Braintree, and using digital signature, he's now running the company while still living in Ukraine, running this EU company. And the purpose why he applied e-residency was that he couldn't manage to sell his paintings internationally because in Ukraine and in most of the other countries, you don't have access to financial tools. You don't have access to payment services, crowdfunding sites. But through that EU entity, through that digital identity, you can have access because we verify this is you. We have done the background check. We have had the face-to-face -face check and you can have access to all the services. And now it's one year past and Stanislav is still painting and selling his uh, paintings internationally. The second example of e-residence is a team from uh, Taiwan. And the girl there right hand side is Chan and her team. Uh, they are selling a bit more complicated products, uh, cryptocurrency cards. So you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies and if you go to ATM you can take this card and it automatically uh, transfers the money to your currency and you can take the money out. The problem with those kind of services is that it really requires high level KYC, who you are. You can't just sell that credit card to online to everybody. You need to be sure that the other person sometimes asks their electricity bill, sometimes asks their passport photocopies, everything. So for them, they couldn't do that startup because they only managed to sell that in Taiwan market. Now they made e-residence integration so that you can log in using e-residency card to their service. And every time each e-resident logs in, we verify that this person has been checked and he's all right and he's the person who he claims to be. And that's how now this Taiwanese team can sell these cars to everybody internationally. They don't need to take market by market to local integrations. They can actually go global from day one just need API integration, authentication API integration to your website and allow everybody internationally to access your services. <coughs> so what's going on? World Forum estimates 1 billion new internet users by 2020, but at the same time World Economic Forum estimates that 73% of people are still financially excluded in the society. And if you're financially excluded, if you don't have tools to crowdfunding sites, uh, credit cards, payment processing, you can't be part of the society in that sense. And uh, what we see in Estonia is that people really love to live there where they want to live in different reasons. The Taiwanese family stayed there because their family is there. Some people go to Silicon Valley because of the funding or Brazil because of good weather or Estonia because of engineers. Whatever are the reasons, more and more people and digital nomadism helps them to be there where they want to be. And now it's possible. After becoming EU residents, they can digitally be part of the economy. They can declare the taxes, digitally sign contracts and work where they want to work. And this is very powerful. And this is why people today become EU residents. And the second reason is access to those services then. And the services only is not about incorporation and bank account. It's like you have heard all, all the services on the stage here today also. Most of them are funding sites, crowdfunding sites. Uh, for example, just recently there was integration with Thunderbeam, who is a crowdfunding site where you can actually buy and sell startup stocks. So as an EU resident, I can be from, let's say, Nigeria, I become me resident of Estonia, and then I put my project on that crowdfunding site. And then I get funded and I can do my business running that globally while still living in Nigeria. This leads to three things. It leads to full location dependence. It le leads to financial inclusion. And it really empowers the people, and, and especially empowers those kind of peop those people who don't have equal rights today, 
whether it's more disabled people or in some countries even women. To have equal rights on internet, to have equal opportunities, equal access to tools and equal opportunities to do business. We launched one year ago. We are still in beta as a government. Um, but we have over 10,000 people who have at this physical meeting with Estonian official has become e-residents. The graph shows how many companies they have been established and running today. And uh, today you still need to travel to Estonia to open a bank account. As I mentioned, this is still a beta, beta version at the moment. And from July, actually today, the bill, another bill went to government that to allow e-residents to open bank accounts also online. So by July, e-residents can open bank accounts also online. And these kind of things will start scaling then. And the best part is that we have used this world today that we have used to know that like ways how you can launder money and ways how you can hide money and and do all that stuff. But what we try to do with e-residence is exactly the opposite. Like exactly the opposite of being transparent. Because Every transaction leaves a digital footprint. And everything you do, we can, if you allow, then we can share with different governments. And, and usually e-residents don't pay taxes in Estonia. It's not the way how you can avoid taxes in your own countries. It's just the tool for location dependence and tool for financial inclusion. In that sense, these Taiwanese family, for example, they still pay taxes in Taiwan. So it means that Taiwanese entrepreneurs we're now enabled to do entrepreneurship. Taiwan as a country receives new tax revenues. And what Estonia means is that the Estonian service providers like banks can offer services to them, hence they earn more money, hence we as a government earn more money through Estonian service providers. So that's why we see it's a win-win-win-win solution. Because in emerging markets, people can now can become entrepreneurs. They can generate revenues to their own countries. And this is just the first step. As I mentioned, it's really grown out of the hands in the sense that the demand is so much bigger. Uh, we have realized that as a government, we can't offer all the services. And that's why we have now opened an app store. App store, how e-residents can be served and can e-residents can log in and can find any services they want. And that's why we are here also to speak about startups how to integrate those APIs, how to offer new service to e-residents internationally. And this is something really new. It's first time government as a, as a service provider offering APIs for everything. You can, you can have API for authentication, digital signing. Next week, we are launching API for incorporation so that you can establish a new company on your own website through the API, which actually then establishes in Estonia. And this is the, the reason is that we as a government are never so agile, so quick, and so fast in that sense to do those developments. And we are never as user friendly as private sector can be. And that's why we are reaching private sector to build the services themselves for e-residents. And I, I see that after a few years, there will be tens of thousands of applications which each e-resident can log in using their ID identity. And I hope to doing it together with you. And next to me, there will be Susan on the stage also from Pit Nation, who already have done integration and can offer something new to e-residents on blockchain. And uh, I think it's very fascinating. So I do believe that together with private sector and e-residents, we can have this earth as the country of everybody. Thank you. If you have one or two questions, I guess we should have time. Please. Taxes. So the taxes is usually international law says you pay taxes very great value. If Taiwanese family stays in Taiwan, they pay taxes in Taiwan usually. No, in that sense we don't. And you yeah, companies are taxed where the value is created, where not where the address is. 
but the address gives them possibility to access services which they don't have access today. Because Braintree, Stripes and PayPal can offer you service if you are EU address and EU bank account. And through that you have access, but you still can pay tax in your own country. E residents and blockchain, what is the relationship? So identity on blockchain has always been one like topic. How do you prove in sharing economy also? How can you trust each other? How can you prove who you are? Governments so far have failed in that. And uh, they have failed in like building that level of trust to manage identities in the first place, then to offer identities which are transparent. And, uh, and in blockchain, there are many use cases today. For example, Nasdaq. Nasdaq today is integrating EU residency. They launched after a few months where you can have online shareholder meetings and votings. It's on blockchain. And, uh, and in, as EU resident, you can log in there. And then you can buy and sell shares, basically. And you can vote on their shareholder meetings. EU resident itself is not on the blockchain, yeah. The service providers usually uh, are on the blockchain. EU residency adds the digital identity phase there. But of course, Estonian, yeah, Estonian government, of course, uh, partly is on blockchain because, for, uh, for example, health records are backed on blockchain. So I can check who has accessed my health record if they had right to do that. And if they didn't have right, then it's court case. So this gives me as a guarantee that I can trust I don't have to trust government, I can trust mathematics and encryption, and that's, that's why I still don't uh, kind of trust the system. Yeah. The data, what we are collecting, as an e-resident, this is next cool feature what we are building actually. You give all the data about yourself, and then there will be a site where you can ask that data back to yourself. It's like public URL, and you can share that data two different private sector companies. So I, as an e-resident, then I'm a holder of my own data, and I share that data whoever I want to. And if I share, that's stamped by government of Estonia that this is correct data, it's checked and face-to-face -face is done. Which means that you have right and you have better access to private sector services if you can digitally share who you are on internet. And the uh, data is owned by the person always in Estonia. It's encrypt uh, and it's the distributed data exchange layer X road if you can Google. But the data is encrypted, it's used RSA 248 encryption there. So basically you can't access my data unless you have my private key and my card. If you steal both of them somehow, then I just close my uh, certificate and you got, and then basically I need to have another face-to-face -face meeting to open another certificate. And that certificate issue can solve also the problems today on blockchain. Like if you lose your private key before it was discussion, there can be a master certificate way how uh, through private face-to-face -face meetings you can re-establish the certificate to open the other certificate. So there are endless opportunities to build those services and that's pretty cool. More questions if you have. Please. Any other countries trying to do that? Uh, we know approximately five countries who are copying this at the moment. And we are helping them to do that because we see that the more players internationally on the network, the more value to everybody. Uh, and um, what else can I say? One thing to understand is that e-residency has been developed through 17 years. We just now opened the gates for foreigners, but the system has been built for over 17 years. So it's not one year task to copy that. And most governments still don't get it still don't get that my private, but my digital name can, should be public. Like, I can't, I don't have to be afraid of my name Casper. Like, if you know my name Casper, like, what can you do with that name? You can't prove that you are Casper. Same way if you know my name is 387120127979. What can you do with that number? Nothing. So why should I hide that number? The number is public, and it's public because private and public sector can both offer me services using that number. But most of the governments, if not all, don't understand that. And that's very sad. And of course, we understand why they don't understand, because they have fucked up things before. And now it's very difficult to like, build that level of trust again. Yeah. Have you pissed off any other governments yet? 
Have I pissed off any other governments yet? Uh, usually the first reaction is confusing and negative, but when they realize that actually it helps their governments and their cities and empowers their people, then they become friendly. And for example, United Nations two weeks ago published an article how e-residency can be like the next big thing in emerging markets in e-commerce and facilitating that. So organizations start to understand also, but the term e-residency is of course, uh, first is like, whoa, what is that? But once you start learning, then you're usually positive. It's a, p a public private partnerships, the identity. It's a public tenders after every three years uh, can, can win another private sector who uh, offers uh, identities. No, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. More questions? Yeah. Uh, which countries? Uh, I can't tell that uh, which countries are copying. Uh, every neighbors are copying everything. That's for sure, always. But uh, but there are big, rich, and powerful financial uh, cities and hubs, let's say, uh, which do that. And uh, and we help to do that. Like I said, like uh, eventually. It's just a matter of efficiency. I, I can't see any government starting after 50 years to offering things on paper. It's just so costly and it, you need to serve everybody. And then the question is, if one country here, Estonia, serves everybody having the same product and then you have 10 times bigger country, let's say F Sweden, who serves only Swedes, then eventually you're just not competitive enough because you have the same products and one serves international everybody, one serves only its own citizens. Costs are the same, user base is a million times different. Eventually, those win who serve everybody. And that's how we see every country is following that. And that is the best part because then governments start to become competitiveness. Like, why Suzanne and Pit Nation, I like them because they are disrupting also like governments. Like, they should be user friendly and everything. And this also helps that, that now each government is not monopoly anymore. They need to compete with each other and hence they need to really take care that services are user-friendly and good. Otherwise, they just lose. Yeah. I think, good question, what's the interest of European country? Early adapter is cool thing. <laughs> Uh, second interest is our business. Try to make applications for e-residents because this is like unique opportunity in the world today. Like government is opening to everybody and you can verify everybody on planet to use your service. And there are APIs for you. So your business case is uh, find the business case. Let's find it together. How you can integrate those APIs what we offered and offer new service to e-residents. Last question, please. Yes. Oh, time out. Sorry. Thank you.